Hi, I'm Jesse Metters with Utica College's online master's and bachelor's degrees in cybersecurity and cyber policy. All right, well, we have a jam-packed agenda. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go and uh, introduce our faculty speaker, Cynthia Ganella. Uh, we're going to talk about the cybersecurity landscape first and really kind of give you a, a, a set foundation of what's going on in the field today. Uh, we're going to look at some of the content for our bachelor's and our master's in cybersecurity program as well as our MPS in cyber policy. Um, we're going to look at some really key things that make Utica College's cyber programs unique. Um, and we're going to look at some of the affiliations that Utica College has and uh, designations that we've received for our program. Uh, we're excited to be able to interview one of our recent, uh, well, I should say just about to graduate from the Masters in Cybersecurity, uh, Dennis Labassiere. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about online learning at Utica College and we will spend some time answering questions at the end. However, we are going to have some time for questions throughout the presentation. So I will uh, uh, hit some of those questions up and we'll be able to answer those for you as we go. So you guys see we have a very full agenda. So let's bring Cynthia Ganella into the program. Um, just so you kind of know a little bit about her background, uh, Cynthia Ganella is uh, she's working right now as a computer crime instructor for the National White Collar Crime Center. And uh, she's a graduate of our master's in cybersecurity. She's also an adjunct faculty teaching here. Uh, so really brings that experience to the classroom, not only as a student, but also as a professor. And she just recently created the first, uh, I think if I got this right, it's a cyber intrusion investigation course for the NW3C, the National White Collar Crime Center. So uh, breaking ground in a lot of ways. Um, hopefully we've got her online. Hi, Cynthia. Good evening, Jesse. How are you? Doing great. Good to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Um, well, let's start off, uh, you know, I, I, I gave a little background. I want to be able to, um, to talk a little bit about the landscape and what we've got going on. So I'm going to kind of start, um, talk a little bit about what, uh, what is happening in the field. I want you to comment on some of these things and really kind of maybe get your, get, give your thoughts and your feedback, okay? Um, so there's a lot going on. If any of you monitor uh, daily news and keep up with uh, things like the data breaches and and uh, you know the foreign cyber attacks that we're seeing today we have a lot of challenges in the cyber landscape and it really spans to a lot more broad areas than most of you may even think um, there may be some people online right now that you know have worked in the field already um, and then some of you this is the first time you're really looking to get into this field so um, when we look at some of the things that are happening there's foreign cyber attacks right we've heard about the Chinese North Korea Iran uh, Russia have been attacking us. We are in a cyber war, whether we like to say it or not. Um, we look at, the, there's highly sophisticated cyber espionage malware. Um, cyber bullying and cyber stalking is a really big issue. Uh, crimes against children, uh, insider threats, right? Uh, botnets, compu uh, cloud computing security. Uh, there's groups like Anonymous uh, that have wreaked havoc uh, within different systems. We've got the Stuxnet cyber weapon, a really major issue. Um, right, Cynthia, with, uh, with what's going on in uh, sophisticated malware that's been, uh, been used on, on attacks. Um, you look at you know, infrastructure security issues that we're seeing, as well as uh, supply chain security. So if you want to talk, you know, maybe touch upon a little of this from your perspective, you know, working in the field, what are you seeing as some of the major threats? Well, Jesse, I've seen an increase in the sophistication and also the frequency of the attacks. The attacks are coming from worldwide, uh, some coming from inside the United States, remaining in the United States, and also targeting, out, targeting outside. But many of the attacks are coming from outside of the United States, and uh, probably some of the higher profile would be Sony uh, last year. Everyone probably remembers that as an attack. Or uh, my own health care uh, coverage, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Anthem, some of the more recent that we keep in mind, but they've been going on for years. However, they're increasing in intensity and frequency and the damage is getting stronger. For instance, a wipe and release where there's actual damage to the data. And we've seen ransomware, we didn't mention it yet, but ransomware is on the rise. You probably, some of you have heard of crypto locker, or crypto wall, where uh, you open up your computer or try to open a document and instead you get a notice that it's been encrypted and the only way to decrypt it is to pay through money pack or bitcoin first you have to research what is money pack or bitcoin so that i can even attempt to pay if i want to 
And then once payment is made, maybe your files are decrypted. Usually they are. Uh, some organizations elect not to decrypt. They elect not to pay because they were cautious and they had a good information assurance program and they made a strong backup on a daily basis and kept that backup off-site available to recover. So they're disaster recovery specialists. But we have seen a pickup over the years in the intensity and in the frequency of the attacks. Uh, it's, it's, it's a scary world out there, isn't it? It certainly is, and uh, it doesn't look like it's slowing down, only picking up, and they're becoming more sophisticated, more creative, and cunning. Absolutely. Um, well, you, you know, we talked about a lot of different things that are happening. Um, I'd like to be able to take a couple questions uh, from some of the attendees. If you'd like to go ahead and text your question in now, um, you know, we can take a couple questions on the landscape. Uh, if not, we'll kind of continue on. We'll be able to address some of these questions later. Um, I don't see any questions coming in just yet that we need to address right away, so maybe we'll just continue on uh, to our next topic. Um, so, Cynthia, let's talk a little bit about the Utica College program. So obviously there's a major threat, right? We have got uh, a lot of need for people to be able to protect our data, to protect our country. Um, let's talk about the different Utica College programs that we offer. So, you know, starting out, uh, many of you may be looking at our undergraduate program in, in cybersecurity. Let's, let's start talking about that a little bit. Um, so we'll look, look at the content for the bachelor's in cybersecurity. And Cynthia, if you could talk a little uh, to that the type of courses that we're gonna, that, you know, that you're gonna be seeing as a student, um, you know, what we're really looking to learn and the different tracks, kind of where we lead uh, students as far as career opportunities. Okay, in our undergraduate program, we have five different concentrations. Uh, the first being information assurance. And we have gone out of our way to map our course material to certain certifications. So we concentrate on the CompTIA certifications in the bachelor's program. So our undergrads, as they're studying, they're also preparing themselves for A+, plus, Security+, plus, Network+. Plus. And those are important certifications in this field of study. And once they complete a area of study, then they may also receive a reduced rate to test. And the tests, they're expensive, so it's well worth it to get a reduction in cost. But careers in information assurance include engineer, so they might be an engineer of a security program, a programmer. Most common languages are Python and Java right now. Those do change over time, but that seems to uh, be one that has taken off. Network Security Administrator works with the Computer Information Security Officer into ensuring that all the policies are um, administered, that they are employed within the organization. Cybersecurity Analyst, the person who analyzes all of the threat data and the information that's coming in, and IT Security. So they maintain security of the organization, perimeter security, inner security, and also work with the uh, network system administrator and the information security officer to ensure that all of the uh, specific policies are upheld. And then we have a another concentration of cyber crime and fraud investigation and yeah. by the way this is the most popular. <laughs> it is a popular one. It's very popular. It's, it's a technical combined with fraud is probably one reason it's so popular. A lot of the scams that you see and different crimes against children, crime involving fraud, uh, banking fraud, things like that, anti-money laundering, specialist, computer forensic examiner, which can be of any type of crime or any type of information that needs to be examined just to get at what really happened, a timeline events. Right. E-discovery, e-discovery is big to, uh, that's a full-time job at an organization. They often hire e-discovery specialists and all they do is pull data based on uh, court requests. Vulnerability assessment to help the information security officer make decisions about what will we do next to protect the organization. Risk and compliance. Uh, there's yeah, there's been some concern, right, about risk and compliance that a lot of organizations are not aware of how to uh, determine their risk, mitigate the risk, and also maintain compliancy for in the banking industry, you know, any financial compliance, also HIPAA now is a big compliance issue. Yeah. And law enforcement. Uh, a lot of 
cybercrime and fraud, human trafficking, for example, cyberbullying, uh, child pornography, any type of crime is against children or exploitation, and then, of course, healthcare, security, and privacy. And those map to the CompTIA A plus and Security Plus. Those are the two that we mapped those to. That's great. And that's another thing that we get that question a lot, you know. Well, I see these job postings out there and they're looking for certifications. You know, how do I how do I get prepared for that and get the degree? And you know, we've been able to accomplish that with the partnership. That's great. Terrific. I, I really uh, appreciate that we were able to map those to those uh, certifications. I had received those on my own before I came to Utica College, but uh, they have helped me tremendously at Utica College. So to have it coupled into the program is a win-win for the student. Absolutely. And reduced rates is really terrific. So the next one is Network Forensics and Intrusion Investigation, and that's more of a computer science background. Uh, network Security Administrator would be one of the career fields. Mm. Uh, computer Forensics Examiner, again, notice that falls into a couple of different categories. Yeah. IT Security as well. So you might kind of think, well, I, I'm, I'm interested in Computer Forensics, and you find yourself, or IT Security, you find yourself falling into multiple categories. And again, we have law enforcement here, healthcare security and privacy, vulnerability assessment, yeah. and then penetration testing, which is also very exciting to a lot of students, the pen testing. Those certifications we mapped are A+, plus, Security+, plus, Net+, plus, and the DC3 certification as well. Yes, I think we're one of the, one of the few schools that even offers a partnership with the DC3 to be able to offer that certification for forensics, which is yeah. really great for the students to be able to have that credibility, you know, if they want to go in the government, right? Uh, a lot of our students are saying, hey, I've always dreamed of being a special agent, you know, I want to work for the FBI, and we have students that do that, right? It's, it's, the, the dream can be a reality at the undergrad level especially. Very much so, yeah. and with NSA, DHS, and DC3, we were one of the first schools. We were number seven, and the only for a while to have all three. That's true. So that was exciting, too. Exciting, yeah. We've always broken new ground, right? We never stand still. <laughs> no, we don't stand still at Utica College, I can tell you that. In fact, thinking about that, we also refresh our material frequently. Yeah. We keep up with what are the trends and if they're uh, now starting to wipe and release and ransomware happens to be the most popular type of malware, then we're going to study it and we're going to update our material to bring you the most up-to-date uh, course material out. So the That's next exciting. concentration is Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Yeah. And those careers include emergency management, policy, compliance, risk management, and law enforcement. So notice law enforcement seems to be <coughs> all the categories. And we match those to A plus and Security plus. All right. The BS also offers cyber operations. Now this is like the red team, blue team, the really exciting um, attack and defend. So cyber network defense, cyber network attack, network exploitation, network operations. Penetration testing, again, falls in this category, as well as vulnerability assessment. And careers might be military, and just applying all of those categories I just gave you to different fields, private and public sector. It's needed among all the critical infrastructure. We have 16 critical infrastructure in the United States, and every one of them are intermixed with each other. So they are very reliant upon each other. If you work in one, then you're also benefiting another. And there are some people that work in multiple critical infrastructure areas. We mapped that to A+, Security+, Plus, Net+, Plus, and also Linux+, Plus because Linux is a tool that's used often in penetration testing and vulnerability assessment. That's great. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, hey, I think this is a good time before we get into the master's content to take a couple questions. I saw some questions come in, so we definitely want to be able to address those. Um, so let's see, we've got kind of a two-part question here from Tim, and I don't know where you're at, Tim, but that's okay. Um, so first question says, um, which top countries or region of the world are most vulnerable for cyber attacks? Um, and then the second part of that question is, what is the job outlook look like for positions overseas in foreign countries? That's a good question, Tim. Um, Cynthia, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one of my thoughts are the most connected countries are the most vulnerable because the more connections and the more 24-7 connections, the more vulnerable you are. 
So that comes to mind, and that could be any portion of the world. It's whoever at the time is the most connected. And things you can do to mitigate that are to disconnect, which no one even considers that anymore. That's true. It's simple, right? 847 connected. You shut the lid instead of pull the plug. Hmm. So those are some things we can do to mitigate. And, and we're actually seeing some campaigns for the best mitigation is pull the plug. You know, stop the activity. No one will use hmm. your computer today as a botnet. So the most connected areas uh, that are running 24-7 connections will be the areas that are the highest targets because you can set up the botnet and they're running 24-7. Hmm. The second part, I forgot what the second part Yeah, was. let me read it again. I figured that we need to go over that again. Oh, he's asking kind of the job outlook for positions overseas. So maybe Tim kind of interested in maybe working overseas, doing some of this work. Um, you know, do you have any insight into where some of the you know, opportunities are outside our, uh, you know, the U.S. borders? I can't tell you specific opportunities. I know Saudi Arabia, there's some positions. In fact, the National yeah. White Collar Crime Center, we're bringing some uh, different uh, staffing personnel over to the United States to train. At one point, we were applying or uh, considering sending some of our staff over to Saudi Arabia, but they're going to come here to get the training instead of sending our trainers there. Hmm. But go to Ninja Jobs. Sign up on Ninja Jobs. There are all kinds of Ninja. overseas positions that are listed all the time on ninjajobs.com. Okay. Now, that's not to become a martial arts expert, right? That's actually cyber positions. <laughs> okay. It's a okay. Cyber martial artist. <laughs> <laughs> Ninja Jobs, that's a new one, actually. I, I hadn't known about that. Uh, so, hey, that's a great tip you got tonight uh, where you can start looking for some of these opportunities. Very good. Tim, hope that answers your question. Uh, I think I had one more here. Uh, and this is actually, you know what, we're going to get into this question. The question was kind of how important are certifications for students seeking an MS in cybersecurity? And I think we'll be able to touch on that as we get into the content. Am I right? Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. We're going to hit on that question then uh, once we get there. And one more question, then we'll get into the, uh, the content for the next slide. Um, this is from Ruben. Hi, Ruben. Um, what would be the best certification track to follow in the cyber operations field? for the undergrad, I'm assuming. OK, if we're talking for the undergrad. I think so. <laughs> uh, CompTIA, start with CompTIA. You need to get that foundation. It's very important to get the foundation. And then you can move into Certified Ethical Hacker uh, and several of the other fields for whatever the specification is that you're interested in. But you need that foundation. Security Plus, Network Plus, those are always highly necessary to move forward. If you don't have that foundation understanding about how security works and how networks work, it'll be very difficult for you. And you know, A plus is kind of a given if you're interested in the field, but it's still right. smart to take the test to go ahead and, and go through that. It, it gives you an idea what those exams are like if you've never taken one. So I would certainly always begin there and then move up because by then you're starting to get some idea, what am I interested in? Because there's a lot of specified certifications and you can move toward. But certainly the CompTIA certifications for an undergrad is a very good place to start. That's why we mapped those initially. Okay. Great. Hopefully that answers your question, Ruben. Um, well, let's get into the, uh, the content for the Master's in Cybersecurity program. Um, I'm going to just kind of briefly touch on some of the first courses and then, uh, Cynthia, if you want to touch on the specializations and kind of do what we did before, let's talk about the career opportunities that the students are going to be able to look at. Um, so, you know, when we start out with the Masters in Cybersecurity, um, you're going to start with four courses. So you'll start with Principles of Cybersecurity. It's going to give you that foundation. We're going to do a lot of hands-on labs. We're going to focus on, um, you know, multiple different topics related to cybersecurity. Uh, we'll take you through a cyber intelligence course, um, so you've got that foundation of understanding of how to gather s intelligence information uh, to use in, in preventing a cyber attack. Uh, we'll look at cybercrime investigations, um, so looking at the laws and, and legal investigation procedures there, uh, some of those techniques and in investigation of a cybercrime, uh, ethical issues as well. And then we take a look at national critical infrastructures, uh, kind of a survey course looking at um, all of our different infrastructures and, and where their vulnerabilities lie. We'll do scenarios. Um, so very interesting course and in kind of looking at those areas. Um, so Cynthia, let's talk about the different specializations because you can go down a couple different paths as well in, in the master's program. Uh, maybe we start with intelligence. Okay, we sure can. So cyber intelligence, that particular uh, area of study is 
the careers include national intelligence, cyber fusion centers, uh, law enforcement. Again, notice law enforcement showed up all through our undergrad program, and it will show up regularly throughout the uh, graduate program as well. Corporate counter or cyber intelligence units, and then Homeland Security Emergency Management. Those fields are all very dependent on intelligence. If nothing else, just to get a contextual view of what's going on, what's the big picture, so that we have something actionable to work with okay. to send law enforcement out on. In the law enforcement field, intelligence gathering might include just gathering enough information to investigate a homicide, or if you have serial mm. crimes, to be able to estimate where might the next crime occur, what time of day is most likely, and to analyze all of the reports that have come in to maybe narrow it down to what type of vehicle is likely to show up next. And then the cyber fusion centers, they pull together all kinds of threat information hmm. from around the nation. And there's 78 cyber fusion centers, more than 78? I didn't realize there were that many. <laughs> Oh, there's only 50 states, but we have seven. Yeah, states. <laughs> so I guess we're trying to be efficient, huh? That's a good thing. Very much so. <laughs> and we collect threat information from local law enforcement, from call-ins, and, and then information that they seek out. And they funnel all of that uh, information up to the National Fusion Center. So there's positions wow. there for cyber intelligence analysts. And I work closely with a lot of those analysts. I teach them in the classes in my full-time job, and then we often end up with fusion analyst in our program at Utica College as well. Yeah, I can think we of have, some folks. We mapped that to Security Plus from CompTIA, but also EC Council. Yeah. EC Council for Certified Disaster Recovery and Virtualization Technology. Hmm. Virtual machines and virtualized technology is very up and coming, and it's been around for some time, but it's getting a lot more notoriety, especially if you work with uh, cloud computing, a lot of that is right. virtual technology, so you need to work in a data center. It'll probably be a lot of virtual technology involved. So that's cyber intelligence. And we also have a computer forensics. Uh, that program you're going to find will be very appealing to law enforcement, e-discovery, computer forensic examiner, whether it's law enforcement, corporate, private, or uh, public doesn't matter, anywhere in their e-discovery and computer forensics are necessary these days, which is probably one reason in our undergrad program that that computer forensics and fraud is so popular. Yeah. So computer forensics is very popular also in the um, graduate program and cyber fraud investigator. That we mapped to the CHFI, which is Computer Hacker Forensics Investigator. It sounds really cool. That yeah. sounds so cool, right? Just to even have yeah. that credential. <laughs> Makes you sound cooler on the street, right? <laughs> I like it. So no wonder it's a popular one. Yeah. And most recently we added cyber operations. Now that's kind of like your red team, blue team, the network defense, network attack, uh, penetration testing again, yeah. vulnerability level. assessment. Uh, you'll end up in fields working in those areas, uh, any type of network operations, military, critical infrastructure. So you're protecting, mitigating, determining risks, and handling those risks with uh, cyber operations. And we mapped those to the EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker, and then also that CHFI, the Computer Hacking Forensics Investigator that we already mentioned. So that's really popular as well. And it, it's our most recent, and it's really become more popular uh, as we move along. Yeah, I found that too. I think with the most of the conversations I have, um, a lot of them with anybody with a technical background. Again, you, you got to have some understanding of what's going on, I feel, to, to get into cyber in t operations. Would you say that's, that's, that's accurate? I mean, you got to have a little bit of a foundation before going into that? Yeah, and it would be terrific if you had Python, uh, the Python and Java languages going in as well. Those okay. are very, very necessary for penetration testing and the Linux background as well for penetration testing. But there's so many tools out there, and they're free. You can work with the tools. We teach them in our classes. Students can walk away and go home and use the actual tools that we teach in the classes. We try to use free and open source tools as much as we can so that you don't need to make a $5,000 purchase to be able to work with the tools. Although larger agencies then will make purchases, and they'll buy enterprise versions. But at least you have the concepts if you're able to continue working with it after class. Mm, yeah, well, it's great that we offer the ability for them to get into the, some of these softwares without having to invest, you know, thousands of dollars and 
uh, get licenses, and you know we're creative, I know for sure, and some of the open source stuff that we use. Um, you know, another a question that's going to come up, I'm sure, and I think we should address it before we get into cyber policy, is we get a lot of career changers that look at our master's program. Where would you direct a lot of career changers? I mean, if you don't have, this is like first time I've really done anything technical. I've got a maybe a criminal justice degree or communications or business. Like what? Do you typically advise is a good starting point if you want to get yourself in the field? Okay, a career changer that's coming into the graduate program. Graduate program, yes. Absolutely start. I really like the idea of starting in cyber. Start in cyber and take those first four courses and then you'll get a feel for which one that you're most interested in, intelligence, forensics, or cyber operations. And if you're much more interested in policy and law, and maybe you even have a background in some of those areas, the forensics or the fraud examination or risk vulnerability management, things like that. And now you want to take it up a level. You might consider the master's in cyber policy. That MPS program is it's more like lawmakers, policy makers, maybe a management executive position. Maybe you're not so interested in being a practitioner anymore or or you just really didn't want to get into the red team, blue team, network defense, and so on. But you can see there's some need for policy, some new policies and updates and laws, and you'd like to get involved in that. Then that might be for you, the MPS and cyber policy. Is that they're geared toward government positions, uh, homeland security, healthcare, financial. And again, law enforcement. It always shows up. <laughs> always goes all back to prosecuting, well, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, we've seen a lot of that, like just in the, in the couple uh, semesters now, we've had one term with the MPS, and the type of people that we've been noticing that are really attracted to the program are uh, a lot of our managers. Maybe they're looking at things from a high level standpoint, you know, to be able to understand, okay, as a manager, maybe like a, a, even a CISO type of position where you're not in the weeds anymore. You're really looking at things high level. You're talking with C-level folks. You know, that's a great option, right, to be able to develop the right policies for your organization or implement new procedures that will help in, you know, in the governance of, of the use of their networks and information, right? Um, we're also seeing you know, a lot of government employees, uh, managers uh, coming in looking at this. Um, we had uh, someone from the Secret Service that's in the program currently. Um, you know, being able to look at developing new regulations, laws related to this is a huge area, right? I mean, we've got so many things that are changing and you need people to keep up with the laws and the policies as well as protecting and, and actually working exactly. in the field, right? And we need fusion center managers as well and just yeah, large data operations center managers. So, Absolutely. Uh, and still, the, the data analyst would be interested in that particular area of study. Privacy officer is huge, and compliance officer. Mm. Privacy officer and compliance officer is probably larger than we realize the, the need for that particular position to maintain personally identifiable information or PII and uh, healthcare information as well, because we do have so many regulations on that, and it is a field that's growing and growing the more data that we collect and store either on site or have access that runs through an organization. So privacy officer, compliance, and then risk from a cyberspace point of view. Yeah, that's a good point. I've got a student right now that's going to be doing the program. Um, she has a background working with the National uh, Credit Union Agency, and she's seeing a real challenge with some of these smaller credit unions and the, the policies they have, you know, and protecting their information and their customers' information. Um, so, you know, yeah, you're right. Uh, the privacy officer compliance side of things is definitely going to be a growing area for this with, with cyber policy. We also have the, the data fusion and analysis side uh, that you can choose from in the MPS. Um, I don't know if, can you speak to that a little bit as well, Cynthia? I think we did a little right. bit with some of the, the risk uh, and, uh, policy and, and uh, compliance. Right. Well, that data fusion and analysis is so important. It's so important that we take a contextual view of all of the pieces of information that are coming in and establish a baseline. What's normal for our country? What's normal for this individual state or wherever that fusion center is? And if you have a terrific analyst or a group of analysts that are working that area, I can pick up the phone anytime and call a fusion center and say, hey, I found this particular thing is occurring in the community. Are you getting any reports like this? Now, that might be the first time they have a report. And then they may also have 50 reports, and they already have a handle on it, and they can pull that case in as well. 
But that takes management skills and it takes analyst skills to be able to do that. And our fusion centers have the ability to do that for us. But we need managers and we need policymakers to enforce policy in the fusion centers. So the MPS for fusion center managers is terrific. Definitely. Well, let's take a second to uh, answer some questions. Um, I know we've gotten some, some questions coming in. Um, so let's try to go through just a couple of these and uh, uh, then we'll get into the next area here. Um, so I've got a good one here from John. He asks, as attacks become more sophisticated, are we facing a greater chance of cyber terrorist attacks domestically and or globally? Does Utica discuss this in the curriculum? That's an interesting question from John from New York. What do you think? That's a good question, John, and yes to both. <laughs> yes, we always, I mean, the, the threats are increasing yeah. by the minute, and we do address this heavily in our courses. In fact, that's one of the largest discussions we have in our courses on a regular basis. We do uh, weekly discussion forums, typically, and we will ask students to bring in current affairs, and we'll talk about them, and what are some mitigating strategies to deal with those new threats that we see. So this is a huge part of our curriculum, actually. That's good. All right, well, we are, uh, want to keep things moving here. Um, so let's get into just a little bit about what makes the Utica programs unique. And uh, there's so many things, right? Um, I feel like there are a couple different factors that really help us stand out and make this program unique. Um, you know, expert faculty like yourself, Cynthia, and the experience you bring and your, and your colleagues in the faculty. I mean, these, these folks have done this work. They do this work on a daily basis, as you can hear from Cynthia. Um, and they're able to bring that into the classroom. Um, you know, we've got 25 years of history in, in teaching computer security and, and economic crime, right? Another reason you see that combination with cybercrime and, and uh, investigations, right, and computer crime investigations is that, is that history and economic crime. Um, you know, we have our Institute for uh, uh, Cybersecurity, Economic Crime and Cybersecurity Institute, where we have a board of advisors, some of the top experts help advise our program, right, and, and give us new content and, and look at, you know, are we teaching what we need to to address the concerns today? Um, so we're constantly getting that input from, from experts in the industry. Um, outstanding reputation in the industry. We're going to touch on that just a second here and some of the different affiliations that we have and accreditations, uh, right? We've got networking opportunities at the campus. We've got uh, all the different certifications that we'll cover next. Um, and then small class sizes, right? So that's important. I mean, you were a student too. The small class sizes are very important. Uh, you it feel like you get a chance important. to interact with a lot of your students? I do, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Every week I have a session, one to two hours, depends on the group and how many questions there are and what we're going through. Uh, there's never a time that I don't have time for a student. I'm fortunate that we have small class sizes. I don't have to put them off and put them off. We can actually meet on a one-to-one -one basis on a conference call or on uh, some type of internet medium where we can look at together whatever the issue is they're having in a paper and resolve that. So they never walk away wondering. They can always walk away knowing, okay, I've got that. It may have been harder than I expected, but I got that. Yeah. And another thing that I think is awesome is our second floor, you know, that we actually have a crime lab that students can tour an actual crime lab and see what that's like as part of their program. So that's not on every campus. Yeah, you can see in the background here, if you can see that, that slide a little bit, uh, that's actually our, our uh, cybersecurity forensics lab, right? On the top there, you can see kind of um, the, uh, the different foil line units, and we do from computer forensics all there, right? So very, very cool that we have that opportunity okay. to have that, definitely. Um, well, Cynthia, let's talk about the, uh, the different affiliations here real quickly, and then we're going to uh, get a chance to, uh, to bring in Dennis so we can hear from, from his experience as an alumni. Um, sure. So uh, let's see if we can bring this up, but uh, we have a lot of different accreditations, right, from federal agencies and organizations that we're affiliated with as well. Um, that really bring credibility to, to our program. So, um, you know, we've got the Def Department of Defense Cybercrime Center certification, the DC-3, there we go. Um, we call it DACA, right? So uh, that is uh, really looking at uh, the computer forensic side of things, right? And it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a stamp of approval. It's a very rigorous process, right? Cynthia, where uh, you've got the Department of Defense looking at all different curriculum that we do in cyber in computer forensics and digital forensics and making sure that it meets that standard. Um, can you speak to any, anything else on that? Um, we specifically sought that. It took, it took time. Uh, it's, it's a difficult, it's a rigorous process. 
but we put forth the effort and we knew that it was important and we weren't going to let it pass. So I, I really applaud all of our staff, managers, and everyone who pitched in all the way down to you know, just writing resumes and all of our bios and putting it all together mm. and really scrutinizing every bit of our curriculum to make sure that we would meet the bill. And we did it. It took some time and some effort, but it's well worth it. And it's a great testament to the dedication of our staff. Yeah. Well, you look at some of the other shields, we've got the Department of, or the National Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security, which I know we're seeing a lot of schools that are going for that. It's still a very rigorous process as well. Um, but, you know, there's some other things that separate us in, in regards to uh, who's certifying. You know, we've, we've become one of the first schools that is uh, an academic uh, certified, um, sorry, it's the EC Council, right? It's at the Academic Center of Excellence for the EC Council. Um, so that is a new one where we've got the ability to offer those certifications you were referencing earlier. Um, one of the few schools that we were able to find that's, uh, that's got that. Um, so all four of those things really, I mean, bringing that credibility to the table. Um, you see here we've got IALEA, we've got the uh, Consortium of Digital Forensic Specialists, um, we've got the Cybersecurity Forum Initiative, that's a, an interesting group of just a collaboration, some of the top minds in cybersecurity. Uh, we have some of their uh, individuals that have gone through our master's program because they wanted the content that we offered, but they've been able to help us in the areas of cyber warfare and uh, they've got a certification that they offer. We've got a huge network bill, I think they've got like 40 or 50,000 people on LinkedIn. Um, so that network just is, is huge that we have the ability to connect with, and it helps when you're looking for job opportunities as well. Um, so Cynthia, I'm going to take a couple questions here, and then we're going to go to Dennis. Um, we'll get Dennis online here. Um, so let's take a couple quick questions be, uh, before we have you jump off, and then we'll, uh, we'll have Dennis come online. Um, let's see here. Let me just look through a couple of these. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, this is from Curtis in Arizona. Um, are we required to have network security uh, certifications before starting, or are we required to earn, or are we required to earn them along the way? I thought an MS from Utica would be powerful enough. What do you think? It's not a, a requirement, but I certainly recommend it. If you go out and and search through the job postings, you will often see the certifications that they're looking for, in addition to a degree. Uh, it shows an, an extra effort on your part for dedication to a certain field of study. So there's nothing wrong with an employer expecting a certification as well. It just shows that you went the extra mile. It's not required to enter the program, and we do supply you with enough information that with extra study you can go out at a reduced rate and get that Network Plus, Security Plus uh, certification. So it's well worth your effort especially if you plan to go out and you're wanting to make yourself as marketable as possible. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Um, so it's really not, it's not required, Curtis, but it definitely be helpful to try to pursue both is, is definitely what we're saying. Uh, we'll take one more here. Um, okay. Just looking through a couple here. Um, this is all, also from Ruben. He asks, so what makes the master's program worthwhile for someone who finishes the, the BS and is in the field? Excellent question. That's a good question. It's more in depth. It's more in depth. Uh, it's, it's more of the same and then plenty more of uh, new information as well. For instance, we take it to the next level in every area that you already studied and we add uh, a lot higher more in-depth tools to your tool belt. You know, the more tools you have, if you're in the field, you know the more tools you have, the more knowledge you have, the more jack of all trades you can be, then the better marketable you'll be, especially if you want to move toward management positions or you just want to get a little bit deeper in or even laterally move across to another position. Maybe you're working as a forensic examiner and now you'd like to get more into network forensics. So the classes are more in-depth and you finish with a capstone. Now, when you finish in the undergraduate program, you finish with a senior project or an internship of like 200 and something hours. But when you finish in the master's program, you finish with a capstone, and that's 16 weeks of rigorous, and I do mean, I teach capstone, I mean rigorous, <laughs> rigorous uh, research. That becomes the culmination of everything that you have learned in your cybersecurity 
education. And as you're moving through your academic career, there are certain milestones, and one of them is that capstone. I've had several students come back to me and say, it's because of my capstone, it's because of that final product I was able to deliver at the interview that other applicants didn't have, that I believe I ended up getting that job or that certification or whatever, yeah. put them a step above. So it, it's definitely worth your while to pursue that uh, master's or graduate degree. Yeah, and actually, this is a great segue. Um, we're going to be talking next with, uh, with Dennis, and uh, Dennis has done exactly that. He went through our bachelor's program and now is just about finished with the, ma with the uh, master's program. So, um, perfect example that we'll get a chance to get into next. So, uh, Cynthia, um, been great having you. Thanks so much for your input so far. And um, Cynthia is also going to be online uh, a little bit later to be able to, to answer some of the questions through text. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and bring in Dennis. Um, so we'll uh, get him all set up. Let me see if there's another question here I can answer as we get Dennis on the line. All right, actually, this is a good question. As, uh, this is from Nadine in New York. Hi, Nadine. Um, as a criminal justice graduate with an associate's and bachelor's field, what would you think would be more suitable? Um, you know, Nadine, the, the great thing about our master's program is that we've created a kind of a, a cyber boot camp, if you will, to get prepared and give you that foundation that you need to know to understand some of the technologies and uh, its uh, foundations of, of cybersecurity and computing. Um, so we can start you with that at the master's level, get you prepped and up to speed with the technology, and then be able to jump into the major courses in the master's. So I would say, I mean, I've seen success. We have a lot of different people that have gone through um, you know, the master's program with a criminal justice degree and had a lot of success. So I hope that answers your question. All right, looks like we've got uh, Dennis online. Dennis, hello. Hello, how are you doing? Doing great, man. How are you? I'm good. Good, good. I hear you are seven weeks away from graduating, my friend. Is that, is that right? Yeah, who's counting? <laughs> you probably have like a counter on your computer, right, where you're watching it all. It's on my whiteboard above me. Is it really? <laughs> Ticky marks every day, right? Yeah. Well, welcome, man. I'm, I'm so excited to talk with you. Uh, I know we've got a chance to chat before and, and kind of, you know, hear your story, but um, I want everyone to be able to, to, to hear your story a little bit. I know you uh, went through our undergrad program, and um, I guess let's start from the beginning, um, you know, and, and we'll try to keep some of it brief, but talk a little bit about your experience. You started as a bachelor student on ground, right, in the cybersecurity program, and Tell me a little bit about that, that experience and leading you now into the Masters. Yeah, uh, I started uh, at Utica College in 2009 uh, as an uh, undergrad taking the uh, cybersecurity uh, undergrad program, doing the computer forensics investigations concentration. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I've always loved technology since I was a little kid, and I thought, you know, there's no better way to mess around with technology than to be in the latest, greatest trend in the cyberspace. So. I, uh, I hit the ground running from day one um, and, and tried to just learn as much as I could in the classroom and learn as much as I could outside the classroom, which I think is also really important. Um, as Professor Ganella noted, you know, this, this realm of cyberspace is changing every day. Yeah. And because of that, you know, what you learn in the classroom day one might not be relevant, you know, two weeks down the line or six weeks down the line or when you're finally done four years later. Um, so to keep up and to be constant with it is definitely uh, recommended on my mighty behalf. Definitely, absolutely. Um, so, you know, you finished the bachelor's program. I've heard uh, you have a cool story of how you got your first job. Um, tell us about that. Uh, you were working with one of our professors and just asking for a little bit of feedback. Tell me a little bit about that, that experience with, with uh, Tony DeSaro. Yeah, uh, Professor DeSaro, I, uh, I actually met when I was a sophomore uh, in one of the, the computer forensics classes and uh, at that time I wasn't really like oh hey you know my future is two years away let's start networking but I don't really forget a name so uh, I seen that I was able to take a course with him in the graduate program so uh, I jumped right on that and got into his class and uh, I actually took two classes with him they were back to back so about four weeks into the second class uh, I'd asked him you know hey do you mind looking at my resume and, and seeing, you know, if there's anything I can make changes to, uh, you have a job and I don't. So obviously, <laughs> something right. Um, and, you know, we shot emails back and forth uh, 
almost daily about, you know, make this change, uh, you know, verbiage wise or just, you know, moving things around and just formatting and whatnot. And I want to say maybe two weeks after I gave him my final copy and was like, you know, hey, you know, I think I'm done with it. Thank you very much. He sends me a text at like nine o'clock in the morning um, and is like, hey, do you want to work for KPMG? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'll take that, right? <laughs> so I've been with KPMG wow. for almost over a year now. So Nice. That is amazing. And just a good testament. I mean, you know, even though at that time you were still a ground-based student, it's the same interaction. I mean, you're in the master's program now. I mean, uh, you know, the ability to have that type of personal connection with your professors, I hear that stuff all the time where the professors are, you know, you create those relationships and that, the ability to really want to help you. Um, you know, as long as you're engaged and you're the one that's, you know, working hard and, and staying connected, right? I mean, is yeah, that yeah. been your experience now in the master's program? Like, talk about that. Let's kind of talk about that yeah. experience, right? You're going from a campus student to online and how's that been? Working full time, trying to manage all that? Yeah, uh, when I was living on campus at Utica throughout my four years in undergrad, I had a blast. I was very involved with the college, with different organizations and sports and a few jobs here and there. Um, and, and also time management with classes, trying to maintain a, a good grade. I ended up graduating with a 3-1. Um, so I think I did very well with that. And then transitioning to the online program was you know, a little easier, I think, um, than taking online courses when I was an on-ground student. Um, because now I have to log in and do things online where when I was on ground, they kind of just, you know, escaped me because I was taking courses face to face. Uh, but the transition was fairly easy. Uh, the courses are not 16 weeks, they're eight weeks long when you're online. And it, it was a fast paced at first, but those four courses, besides building the foundation of the skills that you need, they really help ground you to understand how fast-paced these eight-week courses will, will move along and, and mm -hmm. how to better manage your time. Um, so yeah. that was that was a lot of fun. But the online courses, the professors here at Utica College, um, they have real-world experience, and they will bring that to the classroom day in and day out, and they will be glad to tell you stories, whether they're horror stories or triumphant uh, successes. They will share those with you in great detail. Uh, they love to hear feedback and they love when you communicate effectively and um, they definitely appreciate that students you know interact with them as well and they're not just taking the course uh, those professors work hard to do what they do to teach this material to keep it updated and um, they definitely value some feedback i mean nothing's perfect so they're always looking to uh, ways to make this better yeah, and you provide very, very candid feedback, you were telling me, <laughs> which is what you need, right? I mean, that's the beauty of our faculty. They're very real. They're very down to earth. They do this stuff, you know, and, and it's that, that, that connection of working together. Let's, let's push through this. Let's, let's take it to the next level. Yeah, um, definitely. That's awesome. That's awesome. So have you found that the, the coursework that you're learning in the master's um, has been very applicable to the stuff that you're doing every day at work? Oh, definitely. Um... I feel that the foundation given to me by Utica College has definitely, you know, paved the way for where I am. Uh, besides just, you know, getting the connection with Professor DeSaro, um, you know, the skill set that I have, I feel comfortable when I go on an interview and, you know, I get asked technical questions, or, you know, when a client asks, you know, is this is this feasible or can this be done? Or even a manager or director is like, hey, can you do this? Can you jump on this project with us? You know, I definitely feel comfortable that, you know, I, I can take the bull by the horns. That's great. Or, or the moose by the antlers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> For all you guys that don't know, and you have to look at our Utica.ed website, our, uh, our mascot is Tracks the Moose. So we are all about moose and pioneers at Utica College. Um, well, Dennis, uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the online learning experience that you've had. So, you know, I know we've talked about the, the high level of, of personal attention that you're able to still get as an online learner. Uh, I think you've, you've kind of hit on that, right? So it's not like you're just out in cyberspace and you never really have interactions and you're just typing your questions to an email and maybe getting an answer uh, a right. week later. I mean, what's that interaction been like? Talk, talk to us, maybe give us a picture of what the courses are kind of like as a student. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it really depends on uh, what concentration you're taking and what, what class you're taking. Okay. I, uh, I'm a dual specialization major right now, so I'm taking the, uh, well, I finished the forensics and I finished the operations track, and as you mentioned, I'm in capstone right now. Um, so in the forensics tracks, I mean, you're going to be learning, you know, how to, how to start an investigation, how to write reports. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, you're going to learn virtual, forensic, or virtual machine forensics, uh, Linux forensics, obviously Windows Forensic, um, you're going to hit on these topics that are very relevant today. Uh, in the cyber operations track, as Professor Ganella mentioned, you know, you're, you're going to touch Linux a lot. You're going to learn um, NSM, which is network security monitoring. Uh, you're going to, you know, touch upon um, malware and um, penetration testing skill sets. Uh, so the online learning portion is, you know, it's at your pace, but at the same time, it's easy to get behind but it's also easy to get ahead. Hmm. Uh, some professors like to open everything up, you know, you know, at, from week one to week eight, everything's available. Some yeah. professors keep it a week by week basis. Um, so it all depends on you know how they feel and how they run the course. But it's again, it all comes down to you and it's time management. So it's on your schedule. So you don't have to go to class, you know, every Tuesday or Thursday from you know eight at night to ten at ten at night. You can do it at two in the morning. You can do it at you know, 10 at night, you can do it at 3 in the afternoon. Whenever you're available and you can chip away at stuff, that's that's what's the beauty of this online. You know, it's learning at your own pace, but at the same time, you've got to learn to keep up and make sure you get the work done week by week or if it's due every two weeks uh, because it is an eight-week segment. So uh, after the eighth week, you know, you're either on the next class or you're not. So. Okay. Cool, man. Well, it's, that's definitely helpful. You know, and a couple other things that I'll mention, and, and then we're going to try to take some questions here as we've got uh, just a little bit time left. Um, you know, let's, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the flexibility. You've, you've hit on that, Dennis. Um, you know, there's also some great resources. I don't know if you use those as a student, uh, like Smart Thinking, the Writing Lab. Um, did you use Read and, Read and Write Gold at all or knew about it? I, I know about it. Um, I haven't used it. Smart Thinking I used Did when you? I was undergrad, and I used it as a tutor as well when I was tutoring students in the undergrad. Uh, I haven't really used it in the master's program, I don't think, um, but it's definitely available, and it's a great resource. It is. Yeah, yeah I've been hearing great things. If, you're, if you haven't written in a while and you're kind of like, APA format, I don't know what I'm doing here, um, <laughs> you know, it's a great place to start to, to get some help and get your back up to speed, and you know, many of our students haven't been in school for 10, 15, 20 years sometimes, so, uh, or more. Um, so, you know, this is a great way to kind of get some help, and we have a lot of support in place. Um, as you can tell, we have a lot of great support in the career planning and development. I know you talked about going to the Career Center with me uh, when we were talking earlier today. Um, you know, being able to get that resume looked at, you know, be able to look at jobs that are specific to what you're trying to get into, and, and then, of course, the help with the faculty and career planning, right? Obviously, right. very helpful, very direct and, and hands-on, and um, I know even Cynthia, as a, as a teacher in the capstone, is very, very interactive with the students and helping them identify different opportunities, you know, looking at connections that we all have um, to be able to assist the student, you know, in that, in that final job opportunity. Um, and then we have discounts, you know, that are available for, if you're military, law enforcement, uh, or retired law enforcement, you know, if you're a federal employee, or uh, we have a lot of different companies that we're affiliated with as well. So, you know, that's something that you could definitely talk to one of us about on a personal level as a program manager and, you know, be able to kind of see what your situation is and make sure we can really dive into the information with you. Um, so, we're going to get into some questions. Um, so, Dennis, I'm going to, uh, to read off some questions here. Let's try to get to as many as we can because we have about, uh, about five minutes here. We can take some good questions. And if we don't get to your question tonight, don't worry. We will uh, be answering those. So, we've got some other uh, team here that's on the text and you should be getting some responses back as well. And if we don't get to it tonight, we'll make sure we get you an answer to that, to that question. Um, all right, so question here from Kim in New York. Does Utica have plans to offer the, a campus master's program? Um, Kim, that's a really good question. As of now, I don't think so. We may be able to have some of our classes eventually hybrid, um, so that could be coming soon. Um, but as of now, nothing official. Uh, let's see here. All right, we've got some questions. I think we've answered this. 
Okay, I have, that's a good question here from, from Curtis. I have many years of experience with networking and database. However, I have no certifications other than A plus and a bachelor's in cert, uh, computer information systems. I will be 55 upon graduation. How competitive will I be with just a master's in cybersecurity? Will I have to also earn several other cert security and network certifications to be considered a viable candidate to enter the field? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know, in your experiences with some of your other colleagues maybe at KPMG or others that you've known that are in our master's program, what are you kind of seeing? Um, Dennis, can you speak to that at all? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, experience is, I think, the most important thing that, you know, companies are going to look for. Yeah. Uh, then, then they're going to look for, you know, education and certifications. Uh, you mentioned that you have a few, as long as they're updated and they're not from, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they should be all right. Um, the, the degree, I mean, that skill set you've learned, you're going to learn new things on any new job you take anyway. So uh, they're always going to be compounded based on what you learned uh, previously in other colleges and what you learned here. Um, so I think you should be fine. Uh, that's a really strong networking background. And with that, you should be able to get, you know, a network administration, um, maybe an engineer, depending on, you know, what you what concentration you're taking. I think you should be fine. Um, Feel that question was a little, you know, a little uh, not geared towards what I was able, you know, not not something I'm able to answer directly. Yeah. As if not, I'm not in the industry and I haven't been in the industry that long, but I feel you should be fine. Uh, you have the education, you have certifications, you have experience, which which I would find key if I were, you know, uh, someone looking to hire somebody uh, for network. So. No, oh, it's a good, good answer. I know it's a tough one for you to maybe answer right away. And, and uh, Cynthia may be uh, able to, to text back an answer, too, to, to Curtis that may hit on some different uh, viewpoints as well. Uh, let's see. I think this is a good question. Okay, this, this may be one that you can, you can answer, too, Dennis. Um, this is from Al, I think. I couldn't, I couldn't see the name. Um, so as a QA engineer, I am interested in a dual major between cyber intelligence and operations. I have some Linux, Linux and Python experience. Which major should I consider? Should I consider a career change to becoming a, a pen tester? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that decision is really, you know, on your own. You know, how, how do you feel about a career change? You know, where are you in your life? And, yeah. And all that uh, with a quality insurance, you know, database. I'm assuming that's what you mean by QA. Um, and you have that, that strong background. I think intelligence might be a better track. But I, if you really want to be a pen tester or do something different, then I mean, the operations is there. You can always do both. I mean, that's obviously an option. Um, and and see which one you want to take first. If you want to do an intelligence track uh, and take that concentration first. Take a class and see if it's for you, um, and then be like, "Oh no, I want to switch to the operations." That's that's viable. It's a viable option, um, but that question really falls on you know your shoulders and and where you are with a family and, and where you are in your life. Is it something that you can take on? Um, yeah, I agree. Here's a question. I mean, the concentrations are there, and you know they're interchangeable. It's not like once you take it, you're locked in to take that concentration. Exactly. For the two semesters or the. 32 weeks that you that you have to take it to fill it. Um, if you take one class and you think it's not for you, you know you're definitely able to switch a concentration and, and try a class here and there. You know they're not really set in stone where you have to take one class after another. Um, you can jump around a little bit and whatever floats your boat, whatever helps you out in your life. So I would say that if you really wanted to go pen testing around, I'd do operations, but if you wanted to stay where you were and just have a better skill set, I think intelligence would be the better option. Oh, that's a good, good recommendation. And you had a second part of that question, what's the best way to kind of set up a curriculum roadmap for the dual concentration? Um, that's something that we could talk to you about, Al, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis and really kind of delve maybe deeper into your, your background and what you want to accomplish. Um, so good question. Um, I think we are maybe one minute here. We've got time for one more question, Dennis, and then uh, we're going to have to wrap up. So let me just see if there's any here we haven't answered yet. Um, okay, that's a good question. So I think this is definitely one you can hit on. As an online, this is from Nadine from New York. Um, so thanks, Nadine, for sending a question here. As an online student, uh, what are the different ways in which you can get help? when having trouble with difficult assignments and how often is help provided but Utica, for Utica College, uh, with Utica College for online students? 
yeah, that stuff is uh, something you can speak to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely help is available online. I mean, your professors are there. Some of them give you personal cell phones. You definitely have their email. There's uh, the Engage online learning system you can contact them through. So there's three ways right there with the professor. Mm -hmm. There's your classmates who are probably going to be your biggest, um, you know, shoulders to lean on, so to say. They're right there in the trenches with you. Uh, so the discussion forums that most, if not all, classes have will definitely be able to provide uh, feedback or any Q&A that you might have. If you feel you're struggling with something, post it on the discussion board um, and, and see what other classmates are doing. Definitely reach, uh, reach out and network with them, you know, grab cell phone numbers or emails and, and make sure you contact them. Um, there's the library. Uh, the library has really good resources, whether it's books or journals or any databases that we have uh, paid subscriptions for. The staff in the library is unbelievable. Uh, there's the smart thinking. There's the read and write gold. Uh, I mean, they kind of seem endless, and I'm sure there's more that I haven't touched upon. <laughs> the resources are definitely there to help students uh, learn online. I don't think Utica College or any college in general would have started an online program without thinking about how students can get help when it is just generally based online. There are, I think there's one residency now on ground, right? Yeah, one residency where you'll go about a year into the program. So that's another great way. You know, it's a three and a half day event, uh, usually about a year into the program. You're kind of touching into a lot of the stuff in your specialization, right? You did yeah. one of the residencies? Three. Which one? Three? Three, yeah. I started the program when right before oh they took away the first initial. Uh, that's resident. right. Um, so I had three because I did two concentrations. There okay. would only be yep. two if you did one. Uh, but yeah, the, the great networking, uh, you're able to be at the campus, I think, for the summer one, or the spring one at least. Yeah, summer you're, and fall. Yeah, you're able to be on campus, you can meet the professors face to face, uh, have dinner with them, drink some beers if you're into that. Uh, you can see the beautiful campus that we have and, and reach out to the library there, you know, maybe check out some books and whatnot. So there are definitely, definitely ways that uh, an online student can get some help if they're struggling or if they just want, uh, you know, a little bit of lean on. Uh, I would say the classmates and the professors are definitely your biggest uh, go-tos. Um, they've been mine for six years. I, I was telling you earlier, you know, Joe Giordano, he's definitely there for anybody who, and everybody who asks. Yeah, you told me he's kind of like a second dad to you. I mean, that's oh, just definitely. amazing to hear. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Yeah, the second dad, uh, unbelievable guy, uh, real Italian. So, you know, he, he's <laughs> definitely cool in my book. Uh, <laughs> No, he, he just, he mentored me. He definitely took me under his wing and, and, and made sure that not only did I get a really good experience in an education at Utica, but that I felt that it was at home because I'm originally from Rhode Island. So I'm not, mm. I traveled a long, a long way to get to Utica, uh, lived on campus for four years and, and, and grew, you know, from a young man or from a you know, young boy to a young man. And he definitely mentored and, and guided me into, you know, who I am and, he was very proud of the day I graduated, and I know he can't wait to throw the hood on me at graduation for, for the grad program. And I'm, I'm excited to uh, shake his hand and, and see him again. He was definitely an awesome. unbelievable awesome. person. Well, we're excited for you, Dennis, and uh, really I do appreciate you uh, joining us tonight, spending some time, answering some questions. Uh, we are out of time, so uh, we are going to uh, quickly just put uh, kind of your next steps. I mean, if if this is something that you want to move forward with um, and you've already spoken with a program manager, uh, the next step is to go ahead and apply. You'll see the link there uh, on the screen. Um, so classes start January 18th, so definitely the time to apply is now. Uh, if you haven't spoken with us, there is the number. Give us a call. Uh, we will definitely want to talk with you, find out specifically your situation, what you're looking for, and be able to help you with that, with that whole process. Um, so I want to thank everyone who joined us th this evening. Um, it was a, a formative event, hopefully, for you. I know we didn't get to all the questions, so we will make sure we answer those questions. And uh, look forward to uh, being able to help you as a student. Have a great night, everyone.